Are you having a hard time getting your small block build to idle right? Maybe you got a radical cam in there. Maybe the timing's a little off. Maybe the depth of your knowledge for adjusting your carb is just those two screws on the front and the idle screw. Understand what the difference between ported and non-ported vacuum ports are on your carburetor? Do you know where your idle should even be set to begin with before the carburetor goes on the car? This thing needs to be just right so that way all the factors that go into the metering of the fuel and air in your carburetor are done properly. Do you know where the step up springs are and what their function is? Know how much manifold back you're pulling and how that affects your tune. These are all things that you don't fully understand or you wanna learn or you really don't give a you know what and you just want your car to run right. This is the video for you up everybody welcome back to the channel jason here from golf of america man today we're doing a kind of a viewer requested video um from john deere fam he's having a hard time he's got kind of uh one of these radical cams and he just can't get it to idle quite right and this is a video that i meant to make a while ago i actually shot a ton of the footage and never really got around to editing it so it's kind of uh everything's meeting together so there's gonna be a mix of footage from me talking now and sort of some file footage of me um, putting the last tune on this carburetor. Now when you first get your motor running and it's kind of all radical and all over the place and it won't idle or anything, the first thing you need to do is just get your timing done. And uh, really the thing that matters the most on these cars is the total timing and that's how many degrees it is after you know 2500, 3000, 3500 RPMs. Wherever you want all the timing in at, just pick a baseline, maybe 2,700, 3,000 RPMs. Rev up to that point and then adjust your timing to what it should be. Maybe start off around 32, 34, and uh, then we'll pick it up from there. So one thing I've learned over the years with wrenching on stuff is you kind of got to have a baseline of all the systems before the component you're working on, right? So if you're trying to figure out an electrical issue, if you have a dead battery or questionable battery, you're never gonna figure it out because the car is not in the correct condition, right? Same thing with the fuel system. You wanna make sure your fuel delivery is proper before you're ever gonna get any sort of adjustment or tune out of the carb. I have this Mr. Gasket inline fuel pump with a fuel pressure regulator, an inline fuel filter, and an inline fuel pressure gauge. That way I can keep it between five and a half and six and a half PSIs, which is exactly what these Edelbrocks want. Guys, some of these factory lever operated fuel pumps will put out like 13 to 20 PSI. So get a gauge, make sure you don't have too much pressure going through there. You'll blow all your gaskets out and it'll never run right. Speaking of not running right, if you are running one of these open bore sort of square spacers on your carb and you have a dual plenum intake manifold, that ain't gonna work either, okay? The whole purpose of the dual uh, plenum intake, it's actually to give you better cylinder scavenging for the vacuum on your idle, which will help make a car like this more streetable with a Rad A cam in it. But if you don't have the right spacer, you're not gonna kinda get that effect. So get you one of these four round bore Edelbrock OEM spacers that they made for their car. Link in the description below. Also, if you wanna see a quick video on sort of my fuel system routing and kinda of how I got that going to this Edelbrock carb, check out the card up here. Now these Edelbrock carburetors, they're known for being super reliable. That's why people get them. And a lot of people, I think, pull them out of the box, slap them on, hell, that's what I did. And, uh, and things just don't quite work right because there's so many different types of combinations and tunes that you can run on these engines. Inevitably, you are gonna have to do some sort of tuning. But first, we really need to make sure this thing is zeroed out to the factory specs. And unless you have your primary plates at where they need to be for idle, you are never going to achieve a nice idle. Those idle mixture screws on the front are not going to do anything. And check out the diagram, and this is why. If you look right here at this basic kind of diagram of how it operates, you can see our throttle butterfly plates right here. And if you look, you'll actually see 
uh, the little inlet where those idle air screws bleed some air on the vacuum side inside the engine the inside side of the butterfly butterfly plates and that's how you can adjust and kind of get a little bit more air in while it's idling without moving the plates all right so if you have your butterfly plates clocked open now you have air leaking around these aren't going to affect it because it's pulling vacuum now it's grabbing you know atmospheric air from outside it's bypassing those you're getting nothing out of those so if you aren't getting any sort of reaction out of your idle mixture screws check your idle your plates are probably cranked a third of the way open just to keep your car idling and hopefully after you got your timing done that's not really an issue and you adjusted your timing back down somewhere kind of in the 1000 rpm range hopefully sub if you already got it running pretty good but check out this is the carb when it was off the car and you can see there's another set of a little bleed here and this actually allows a little bit of air to bleed by even when the plates are closed so you want to adjust your idle just to where this bleed peaks out from the bottom of the plate. And that's a good starting point. And that's gonna give you control of your air idle mixture screws. And you can go ahead and put those zeroed out. All right, so double check for your carb, but a good starting point on most of these Edelbrocks. Put your screws in all the way and then back them off. One and a half to two turns. I did two turns, but make sure you count your turns because every little uh, adjustment of these screws is gonna make a huge difference all right so this is when i normally put the vac gauge on and you could really do this by ear if you don't have a vac gauge because you'll hear it kind of sucking a little bit stronger but it's always nice to have some good empirical data so we can do this it's going to help up later when we uh go to pick out our step up spring so stay tuned for that and i did put the chapters at the bottom so that way you guys can kind of hop around let me know if you like that or not if it's worth the time or effort but i kind of like it when i don't want to watch the guy talk i just jump to the section i'm at so give me a thumbs up if you like me trying to save your time. So we have two different vacuum ports on the front of our Edelbrock carburetor. We have a ported and a not ported. What does that mean? All right, so our ported is right here on the driver's side. And basically what that means is there's a little port and this thing is going to get vacuum even when the car is idling. Because where the vacuum uh, sucks in is below our idle plates, below our butterflies, right? Then we have this one over here, and this one is the one that is going to provide vacuum whenever we come off idle. This one does not receive a vacuum signal when the car is idling because it's pulling vacuum from above the throttle plates, and this is what we want to run to our distributor. That way we're getting no vacuum advance at idle. Now this could be an extreme way to smooth out your idle or off idle. And back in the day, some of these cars had like two vac advance cans and all kinds of different ports and stuff to make it like Cadillac granny smooth. But we're trying to lobe out at the intersection, right? So now that we got those ports straightened out, we're gonna go ahead and put our vac gauge in the one right here that's straight ported right into the manifold. So that way we can see effectively what our manifold vacuum is. Now from here, it's just a matter of making little bitty adjustments, doing quarter turn out here, see if that vacuum comes up. Sometimes you gotta give a little yip to the throttle, let it settle back down to really get a good reading on that vacuum. And if you get it to the point where it goes up, now try bringing it back in and see if that raises or lowers it. But you always kind of want to go about a quarter turn back in from the last turn that gave you more vacuum. The other thing you want to pay attention to when you're doing this though is your idle is going to go up. So your idle goes up, lower it a little, kind of start over. I'm going to show you this video in real time so that way you can see kind of what I did and um, that way you're not disillusioned at how long this might take.
Now that we got our idle set, we got a good little mix. Let's go ahead and talk metering rods. What are the primary metering rods? What do they do? They basically just transition from our idle circuit to our primary fuel circuit, which runs kind of out of those main butterflies in the front. So how does it transition? Well, if you take a look at the drawing here, they give a really nice diagram in the manual. And these are the metering rods. They're kind of like needles. And the car's vacuum sucks down a piston. And this piston, when it's down, sticks this little tiny needle in the jet and plugs it. And when that's plugged, the car operates off from the idle circuit. Well, as soon as the car needs more power and more fuel, this little tiny rod lifts up and allows fuel to flow down that primary jet and into the carburetor and into the manifold and into the cylinders for combustion. Now, how does this jet know to open, you say? Well, this is all like archaic, right? It's all vacuum. A little engine vacuum 101 for people because you hear like the vacuum advance on the distributor and uh, mechanical advance, right? You don't even really need the vacuum advance on the distributor because what the vacuum advance does is it helps the car run a little bit more efficiently, a little bit more leaner under a low load condition. And how does the distributor know when the car is in a low load condition? That's when the car is creating a lot of vacuum. So whenever the car makes a lot of vacuum, it's in low load. When it makes a lower vacuum, it's in high load. So the way that the carburetor responds to this is when there's a drop in vacuum, these little tiny springs called your step-up springs give resistance to the vacuum that's sucking on the piston and that metering rod is released. And that transitions from our idle circuit to our primary circuit. And sometimes it could be anywhere in between. So that's why having this very basic system dialed in will make a night and day difference on your car. So before we get into the metering rods and all that, I'd like to just start with the step-up springs. So your step-up springs are loaded right underneath these little tiny plates. You've probably seen them a million times, held on by like a T15 or T20, something like that. Grab you a Torx bit set because uh, this whole thing's held together with them. Open up those and then you're gonna see your little pistons, you're gonna see your metering rods. Underneath those piston cups is your springs. There's actually a chart inside the manual. That's why it's kind of nice to know what your vacuum is, at least as a starting point, help you select the spring. Basically, the more vacuum you have, you're gonna need a stronger spring, so that way when you romp on it, it will release it quickly. And then the less vacuum you have, you want a weaker string. So that way, even that weak little idle vacuum can overpower that piston and pull the metering rod down to get you out of your running primary circuit and into your idling circuit where you need to be to make this thing idle right. In this shot right here, you can see that those metering rods are bouncing all over the place. The springs are just way too heavy. The, the engine vacuum can't overcome them. So the car is not gonna really run right because it's constantly going rich lean, rich lean, rich lean, which is affecting everything, right? Every time you adjust one little thing on this, it affects the next thing down the line. So you just gotta keep going in this circle. We wanna get to the point so when the car is idling, those piston cups are sucked down and that metering rod is blocking our primary jet. So just idling, they should be down. The second we give it some throttle, we want to watch them pop up. If you got a little bitty stumble, it's probably because these things aren't reacting quick enough. If you got a lot of bit of stumble, it's probably your accelerator pump, and I'll do a different video on that. Let me know down in the comments if you want to see that. But let's just start off with getting this idle stuff sorted out first. Once you've selected the springs that give you the optimal operation of the piston cups and the metering rods up and down, the transition between low vacuum, high load, and low load, high vacuum conditions, we're ready to go for a test drive.
test drive, the car has had a chance to run through a couple cycles, really build up some vacuum, get some fuel going through it. And we got a feel for what it feels like. Is the idle a little high? Is the idle a little low? In these cars, you want to have the idle like 650, 750, and you want to set it with the car in gear too, right? You don't want to set it and then put the car in gear and then go pump. It's like operating on a, an outboard engine without testing it in water. It runs different in the water, out of the water. These things will spin like a top in the driveway, throw them in gear, and then they just <laughs> That accelerator pump is definitely something that'll make you <laughs> So let me know if you want to see a video on that. My recommendation after the test drive is to do everything all over again. Run all the way through it. Last time I rebuilt this carburetor, I moved my jet size up one on the secondaries, which really helped. It gave it a lot more power, but I also increased my metering rod size for um, my primaries, and that just made it too rich for the way I cruise this thing around town. And initially I thought the car was just too lean and that's why it was running so bad, but it's just because I hadn't done the things to kind of zero it out. Definitely pick you up one of these kits. It's got all the springs, rods, and jets that you'll need. I got a 1405. There's definitely different ones for the different models and you can buy all the rods and stuff individually. It thinks that it's like almost a hundred bucks, but it's totally worth it. Like I said, I took this whole carburetor apart at one point. I replaced the secondary jets with things that were in this kit, got it running good. I did put uh, the next step richer primary uh, metering rods in there. But by the time I got everything dialed in just right, like I just showed you to, I realized the primary circuit was a little too rich. So I went back to the factory richness. It was just these step up springs weren't quite right. And I had my butterfly valves open so large that I couldn't get any sort of mixture out of those idle screws. So definitely follow these direction guys. Let me know down in the comments if this helped you out. Let me know what else you want to see tuning wise on these old cars. Thanks a lot guys and I'll see you next time. She burned